I will now introduce our first speaker of the day, Carlos Palminha, Head of Technology in Landing Jobs. Please, Carlos, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. So I will share my screen now. Let's do this. Okay. So thank you so much. And it's quite an honor to open the, the Distributed Teams Conference. And the topics, it's, it's a good topic to open the conference because it's about distributed models and software development and how to scale. And I will talk about a uh, use case and talk about Linux and how they will be able to scale the software development using distributed models. And um, before we start, we'd like to ask the audience to reflect a bit uh, on Linux. So I don't probably you have here the sysadmin guys and the infrastructure engineers. So these guys will say, I use Linux today. So no, I'm not talking to these guys, I'm talking to the majority of the audience. And for you to reflect, when was the last time you used the Linux operating system? Probably some of you will think, well, it was this week, last month. Maybe some of you will say, well, uh, last time was during uh, university. Probably some of you will say, well, I never used Linux in my life. Or at least this is your reflection. And now I want you to look to your right or to your left. Probably you, you will have your smartphone uh, near your desktop or your laptop, or probably you are using your smartphone to see this conference. And I will ask you, is this an Android phone? And if so, let me tell you if the phone is turned on, you, as, you are using Linux as we speak. Yes, it's true. Uh, Linux is inside every Android phone. Uh, so probably this might be shocking for some of you, but it's true that we are all using Linux inside our mobile Android phones. And this is incredible because uh, Linux, it's not well known uh, operative system uh, for the mobile, at least for the majority of people. Of course, tech people will know this for score but it's used inside your phone. And it's something you can easily check on your phone. So if you go to your settings of your phone, so this is mine in Portuguese, you will see here a lot of information about your phone, the resolution, and you see down here, the kernel version. And the kernel version you'll see here on my, on, on my case, the kernel version, this is the Linux use using the version of Linux that your phone is using. And this is incredible because uh, last estimate uh, say to us that probably there are around 2.7 billion smartphones in the world. And from these 2.7 billion, 85% are running Linux operating system. This means that probably around 2.3 billion devices running Linux. So imagine if everyone, half of the population is awake, so probably we'll have one and a half billion devices using Linux as we speak, connected and probably connected to the internet. And of course, the internet is also a well-known spot for the Linux usage. Uh, if we, the last research from the top servers uh, in the internet, 96% were running Linux. So meaning from 96% from the 1 million servers, the top 1 million servers are running Linux. And of course, the Linux usage goes behind uh, mobile phone servers. It's if you think on Hollywood, Yes, Hollywood also running Linux. So if you think on the special effects uh, made in Hollywood, for all movies, 90% of the special effects were using Linux, rendered or edited using Linux operating system. And looking at the future, we foreseen with the Internet of Things and IoT, that there will be around billions of devices uh, connected as an IoT devices and probably most of them will run a version of Linux or an embedded Linux or some kind of uh, uh, version from this operative system. So it's incredible how this software uh, is present in our daily lives without we noticing it, even in space. So if you look at the SpaceX, uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, they are using Linux as a control software. So this was the, the rocket that launched recently uh, the two astronauts from the uh, United States, so the first commercial flight from the United States, the Falcon 9 was running Linux. So the rocket that lands automatically on the ground, this is based on Linux operating system. So it's incredible how this operating system is present in our daily lives, in our day-to-day -day activities, and even in space. And uh, the great thing of this software, it's completely free. 
So it's based on open source. It's a, a kind of open source license. There are a lot of licenses on uh, based of open source, but this software is really, really free. And what do I mean with really free? It means that you can go as we speak uh, to a repository, get the code, see the code, download the code, use it for your own will, for your own use cases. But more than this, you can still modify this code and you can still use it. So it's really free for you to modify it and use it in your use case. Or if you want, you can distribute this code. So people can download the Linux uh, original version or they can build their own version and distribute it. So it's a really a free software that is running the majority of the systems in the world as we speak. And the amazing is that this software is 28 years old. So uh, it, it will turn 29 in August. And it was invented by this guy, Linus Torvalds. So this is his picture of him, recent picture. And this is him 28 years ago. He was an uh, engineering uh, student in Helsinki, uh, in University of Helsinki, when he created this operating system. And why? Because he was studi studying computer science. And at the time, there were no operative system or free operative system that will enable him to understand how computer works, how operative system works. And so he decided to invent an operative system. And at the time when he invented his operative system, he published his message saying to the world, hey, here is my operative system. So you will see here that his original message. So this was published at, at news group. So news groups was the what we can call the precedent of uh, social networks. So it was the social networks of the time, so 1991. And this was his message to the world. Say, and it's funny, uh, I want to highlight the, the first line where he says, I'm doing a free operative system. And he says, it's just an hobby. It won't be big and it won't be professional. So he was. this was the famous last word from Linus Torvalds. He was far, far away to imagine that 28 years after, this was one of the most used software around the world and a lot of use cases. And so when he published this, he started to attract uh, developers, mainly at the time were developers from university students, uh, computer science students that also, also want to learn how an operating system was working, how a computer was working. And so they decided to start contributing and using Linux uh, operative system. And so I say that the first 10 years of this system were really based on a centralized development model. So you see that in 91, Linus published the first uh, Linux version saying to the world, I'm doing this. After one year, he launches a, what we call a beta version of the kernel. And only after more or less three years, he launched the 1.0 kernel version. So this was the first stable version of the kernel after three years. And then if you see the release cycle, it starts to, to release stable versions. So this, these are the even numbers. So at the time, the odd, were not the stable ones, they even were the stable ones. And so he started to gradually attract more people. Uh, after a couple of, in 93, there were 100 developers and they, they start to attract more people and they start to have a problem because uh, in 96, 97, 98, there was at least two to three years for them to launch a stable version. And this was a problem because there were already companies uh, using this software IBM announced in 2001 that they will invest 1 billion, at least they would say that they will invest 1 billion in this software. So things were getting complicated because everything was dependent of Linux Torvalds. So they were not using any kind of source control versions. So the, the, the contributors of Linux would just send them the code to Linus. Linus will get the code, just put the code on his file system, merge the files, compile the files, and then distributed the, the version. So this was really, really a centralized model based on one guy that was just collecting this information from a, a lot of developers in the world that was just contributing to this operative system. And of course, this was not able to scale. They could not rely on one person to release a software in every two or three years. So they started to analyze what, what they could do to, to scale the software. And at the time they find out that they had a problem the version, the source control systems and the source control software that existed at the time, like CVS or SVN, were not able to cater for the model that they, they were looking for. 
so these software control systems were centralized and they were not able to run in a distributed mode. So this was a pain for the community. They even tried a commercial software called BitKeeper, but it was commercial and it was not suitable to, to, to grow. And so Linus decided to invent Git. So in 2005, Linus Torvalds, the father of Linux, also is the father of Git. And, and it, it's incredible to see how, how Git was invented and you can dig a little bit and it can be also a, a theme for a different talk, but Git was just made in one week. So Linus, after one week, they were already using Git to control the software uh, of Git. So this was a eat your own dog food example, but this is really incredible how they created this tool that it's used today in most and majority of cases of developing software developers in the world that using Git. And it's funny because this was really, really a breakthrough. So the father of Linux, the major technological breakthrough from the last 30 years is also the father of Git. And so this was a, a pain for, for the community because at the time, uh, the, the existing software control system were using a very centralized model. So this was a central repository. People will get the code from this repository and then just push their changes, their commits to these central repositories. And of course, this was what Linus was doing for the last 10 years, and it was not scaling. And with Git, they were able to move from a uh, centralized model of controlling software to a completely distributed model of controlling software. Of course, you, we still have cases, and probably the majority of companies as you are using Git as a more or less centralized uh, model with a central server, but the Linux community is really using this as a distributed service. So there are a lot of repositories ar around uh, the system, and then people can just uh, get a copy of that repository, work on that repository, and push those changes. And the repository managers or people just can push and pull from different repositories, making this a fully distributed system and a way to control software. And this was a major breakthrough as we're going to see next. So till the central, what we call the centralized model, and this, this is a graph uh, showing us million lines of code. It's just a measure to, for us to understand how Linux evolved. So the first 10 years were really uh, very linear and smooth growth. Even in some years, they, the million lines of codes would, would get down instead of growing. And this means the operative system was stalling. With the introduction of Git, so this was version 2.6, there was a little, a little step up in, in number of my million lines of code, but then we hit what I call the growth year. So this was the last 15 years where Linux growed exponentially, like you can see. So this was the last 15 years, and you can see the versions, more versions per year and more lines of code, and you see a complete growth. And this was because they started to adopt decentralized uh, management of software. And so what we reach today, it's the largest collaborative software development project ever. And even not collaborative, even if you compare to commercial projects, this is might be the largest one of ever, all time. So today there are around 33 million lines of code in Linux. So it's incredible. And if we can check the rate of change in terms of lines of code, uh, there are 11,000 added lines, 6,000 removed, and 2,000 modified. So this is a rate of change per day. So every day, this uh, is the amount of changes that Linux suffers. And this is incredible because it gives you nine changes per hour. So this is probably the, the software with more changes in the world. And you might ask at this moment, so if they are changing the software so much, how they, can how they can ensure quality and stable software. Yeah, it's true. They can do this with periodic releases. So a software this big, they have a new release every six to seven weeks. And this, is been, and this has been like this for the last 10, 15 years. Every six to seven weeks, there is a new version of Linux. This means probably five to six releases per year. So this gives you a, a, a brief uh, expectation of what you can get from Linux. And when I mean releases, I mean stable releases. So the Linux community ensures that when they release 
the version of the kernel, they guarantee that we'll work and will not break the compatibility with our applications. So this is their model. Every release must work. So it's really working software. And this gives you a lot of trust on this software from several companies in the, in the world. So this trust on distributed model comes from IBM that using the system, NASA, and you can saw SpaceX is using Linux, the United States Navy, even Microsoft. So the Microsoft changed to Linux in a, in a couple of years ago. The New York Stock Exchange, Google, Facebook. And Facebook is very interesting because when they update their servers, automatically when there is a new release of Linux. So they are doing this for a couple of years and never had major problems with this approach. So it's really a trustable uh, network and the companies really trust uh, on this space of development and this rate of change. And by using the latest version, they ensure that they will have the latest bug fixings because this is also something that the community wants to do. So every bug fix must be present in the next version. So there is no bug fix in an historical version. This is must, must be done in the latest version and then backported to uh, older versions. And so in terms of uh, dimension, in, in terms of contributions to the code, and since 2005, the community has made a, a count on contribution and it's around 14,000 developers. So it's incredible the amount of people involved in this project. So these developers, you might think, oh, these are just hobbyists or uh, technological uh, geeks, engineers that want to contribute. No, M majority of these developers come from companies. So the companies pay their salaries for they to work in the Linux open source project because they will use this software in their own use cases. This means that probably there is an active community, active meaning people that are actively contributing, about 5,000 people. and probably per release, we might have uh, 2,000 people involved in one release. So this is probably the actively community in open source and in software. So they just made a calculation to redevelop Linux, it would cost this amount of money. So it's completely impossible to go to try to do this in a commercial way or in a centralized way, because it would be just uh, impossible to do it. And if you can see, if you look at the top contributions from Linux, we see some of big companies. So we can see Intel. This is was, uh, there are some metrics from 2017. Uh, we also have uh, Linaro, IBM, of course, consultants. So these are paid professionals by companies or by the Linux Foundation to work on the kernel. Samsung, Google, uh, Renesas Electronics. On the right, we have Oracle, ARM, uh, NXP semiconductors, Facebook, it's uh, also a major contributor of Linux, uh, NVIDIA, the graphical uh, company, and also Microsoft. So Microsoft in 2017 was not so active, but uh, in 2020, they were on the fifth position. So Microsoft is already the fifth contributor of Linux today. And so how did they were able to scale? So we already saw that um, the, 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 the Vertin control system was a fundamental change in the way they were doing software, but how they are, are organizing themselves, how, how, do, how they can organize all these companies working with teams inside the companies, teams outside the companies, how they can go for, a, for this model. So if you look at the code and uh, the organization of uh, the developers, is really uh, a, sh a mirror from the code. So if you look, the, the code of Linux is organized with archi architectural patterns. So they, they have the CPUs, the different CPUs they support. They have subsystems, for example, for USB subsystem. They have network subsystems, so the code that takes care of the network. Inside the network, they might have the Wi-Fi subsystem. Inside the USB, they might have the USB mouse, USB keyboard. So the first layer, it's really about the subsystem maintainer. So this, this character, the subsystem maintainer is really someone in charge by one subsystem. And when I mean in charge, it's not the one dictating the way to go, but it's really the one organizing the code. You might think this as a more or less a release manager of a subsystem. And, and um, the main task of the subsystem maintainer, it's of course to build a network of trust with other subsystem maintainers, so his peers, but also builds a network of trust with the driver file maintainers. 
And what is this driver file maintainer? So imagine that we have the USB subsystem and inside USB, you might have USB mouse, a USB keyboard, a USB headset. So these pieces of hardware will have a dedicated driver or in some cases a file to control. And so this driver, this part of the kernel, this, this part of the subsystem will have a maintainer that is responsible to organize that work. And also these maintainers will build a network of trust between their other maintainers inside the subsystem and between the developer community. So the developers will be engaged with the driver maintainer and that will create a network of trust with these maintainers. And so how does a developer uh, does to, to submit a piece of code? So if you think a developer, the developer will get the code from a public repository. He will just start working on whatever he wants. So there is a full autonomy for developers to work on every piece of code. So if a developer finds out a bug in any subsystem, he can just provide the patch to, to that subsystem. And when I mean a patch, the patch is the basic unit that developer can work. So a developer make a change on his machine, he might test the code, and okay, he says, okay, this code is okay, I will send to the, to the driver maintainer. And we'll, it will be probably a mailing list, so all the communications will be public, all communications are done by, via email, so everyone will know what's happening in every part of the Linux kernel. They are public. And so this developer will use a common format, what in the community called the patch. So I don't want to go into detail, but every patch will have this format. We'll have a header identifying the commit ID. So every piece of code that is committed will have a unique ID. So this is a particularity of Git. Uh, so the guys invented Git to solve also this problem. You will have the person that created the code, the person that committed the code. In some cases, it will be the maintainer of the subsystem that will commit the code in a public repository. Below, you'll have an explanation of the problem that was solved. On the third part, you have a sign off. This is incredible because this solves a problem with legal, uh, legal aspects of the code. Because when a developer sign off a code, you will say, I was the one creating this code, but I'm also, I'm also granting uh, this code to be used in a public license. So this, is, this was the way that the community uh, was able to fix the legal aspects because we'll have a lot of companies that will contribute. And this way, the person in name of the company will say, I'm giving this code to the community. And below, you will have the code. So we will see minus, it was the lines removed, plus it is the lines change. And this, if you pick this section, you can put it on Git and it will work. And so the, every developer will need to use what we call this template of patch when want to change the Linux code. And so this creates a, a standard in the communication. You even have having mailing lists that are automatically checking if the patches are okay. And the developer gets an email saying, your patch was not uh, uh, corresponding to the format, please review the patch. And this patch will then, like I was saying, it will then be uh, discussed in a community. So the, the developer will send this patch to a mailing list to the maintainers of the, the driver of the file, and this will be discussed in the community. So any developer can comment on that code. And when I say comment, it's really replying to the email, replying in line with the code and say, no, no, this line is not okay. You should change this. It's not uh, with the good code standards. Uh, if you do this, it will not work on this hardware. So this, there is a discussion. It's like a distributed code review process uh, while the code is not accepted. And this can take uh, several days. Uh, and if the, the community is not happy with this code, the developer will need then to send a second version of that code. So we'll need to work on the code, improve the code. And when someone in the community says, okay, I, I sign off this code, I accept this code, the driver or the file maintainer will send this code to the subsystem maintainer. So the subsystem maintainer will get this code and merge it immediately in this repository. And the subsystem maintainer will also do this for all the driver and file maintainers. So the network of trust that I was talking about starts to scale. And this is true because then the subsystem maintainer will send this, the code from all the developers, all the maintainers to the next version of Linux, the call Linux Next. And the same will happen with all the subsystem maintainers. So it's starting to grow organically around the code and also around networks of trust between 
uh, individuals and, and their maintainers and the developers. And to exemplify how this works, I'm going to show you a little animation. So this was made with a tool from 2012, but it's still up to date. So you, st you still can check some videos from recent uh, Linux. So this is six weeks of development of Linux. So you'll see the, the, the little persons are the commits that are coming to the several different subsystems. So you can immediately see that the architecture of Linux around uh, the several pieces of software, and you can see how this grows organically. So it's incredible. So this is just six weeks, but it's incredible to see how a software can scale uh, with a really, really distributed model. So you can see clusters around certain topics, depending on which things are more, more hot at the moment. And you can see then subsystems of subsystems and clusters of clusters. And you can see how the developers organize themselves to send the code. So this is just a, a quick example for you to see how uh, what we were discussing uh, some slides ago, how this was scaling and scaling so fast and with so many developers. And so this network of trust really, really builds the, the, the basic for uh, companies to trust on this software. And you see that in this the, the example that you saw in the animation, you can see how this organically grows around the, the code. And so uh, you might ask a question, but uh, this is a community of, of uh, developers. Do they meet? How do they organize themselves? So if you see here, you might have uh, companies that are working <clears throat> in specific parts of the kernel. So if these companies are paying their developers, their developers will naturally build a team inside the company that will work for a specific part of the kernel. But for example, in a company like Intel, they might have different teams. Intel is working on uh, graphic adapters, sound adapters, CPUs, memory. <laughs> and so the teams will organize inside the company as any other company. So you might have a team working in a, in a CPU in India. You might have a team in the United States, another team in Australia. And these teams will organize organically inside the companies. Of course, we will also have uh, developers that are not working for companies, consultants, uh, or other companies that will organize the same way and still keep uh, making links with other teams in other companies. But of course, the, the community realized that they had to, to meet face to face. This was something that in the, in the, in the, in, in the beginning of the kernel was not uh, very critical. But after 2001, they start to meet periodically. So there are a lot of events. And these events are already around specific topics. For example, we already have events around the embedded Linux and open IoT. We also have a dedicated event around security. We have an, an event around automotive. We have an event around the virtual machine topic. So these are already events that popped up around specific topics around the operating system. And of course, these events usually take one week. So if the teams want to discuss specific topics about a specific part of the kernel, they will go to these events. But there are more hardcore events, like I will say, like the Linux plumbers or the kernel maintainers. So they, these are specific events to develop. So when I mean, these are not just mere conferences. This is one week, like bird of feather sessions, hands-on sessions, where the community will meet will join and they will solve complex problems. So they will meet, they will stay one week together, one room trying to solve complex problems, resolving architectural problems of the, of the system, trying to merge complex patches. And this creates a great purpose around the community. And these events, probably the teams in, in, in the Linux community probably meet uh, in one or two months or six months. So, but uh, every now and then, but at least twice or three times per year, they will meet. And this is incredible because this is a model that uh, can scale in a mixed environment. So you can have dedicated teams that are working in a company, but they have these needs to talk to other teams working in different companies or in different parts of the, the Linux operating system. And so what I would like to summarize the, the key takeaways from this use case from Linux and distributed models and the first one is really about standardized communication. So as you saw, the Linux uh, developers will need to use like a form of template to, to send the code. It's called a patch. So even if the patch is not properly uh, standard, they will have a script saying, you're not properly formatting your patch. Go send it again. 
And this is really, you might think that email is a old school communication, but it's really the way for asynchronous communication. Because in the community, you have uh, developers in different time zones. So when a developer sends a patch, the other one might be sleeping, might be on holidays, might be working uh, in a different stuff. So asynchronous communication is really key for the success of Linux. And of course, because this is email, then the other developer can comment directly by email by just replying to that email and commenting the code. So this is really incredible how, how they could scale um, the software development based on email communication and text-based email. And even the code that they will send to be committed are using email. So if, if you guys are using Git, if you have more engineers on the, on the audience, you will know that Git will have commands to send directly patches by email and getting patches from email and committing on the tree because this was a tool <laughs> designed to work with the community. And so the next, the next one, it's transparency and autonomy. And here, from day one, that, that the, all the communications of Linux are made via mailing lists, via public mailing lists, via public emails. And since day one, the communication is really transparent. So you can see what's happening in the Linux community. So you can see what you will have in the next version of Linux just by looking at the communities or by looking at the open repositories, you will get a sense of what's going to happen. And of course, a lot of autonomy. So there is no central piece saying uh, we now should work in the next three months on this feature. No, if you want to work on a feature, you can work. You submit it to the community and the community will review it and then we'll go to this process and we'll accept it. And this is a practice that the community is doing every day since the, the last 28 years. And of course, we have embraced change. Like you saw, the rate of change is so high in Linux and they have this motto, don't let reality catch your technology. And this is incredible because this was the way that Linux was able to be what the, the most used operating system in the world as we speak, because they embrace change, they adapt and they, they, they release frequently. So this is also a way of them to be able to do all the technical uh, companies to use their software to embrace change. And of course, purpose. So the community have a strong, strong purpose-driven community. And, they, and their first motto is really working software. As you saw, every release must work, even every patch. So this is a rule of thumb in a Linux community. If you submit the patch, that patch must not break the build. So if you send the patch, everyone using that patch will still be able to compile the software and have Linux running. So this is really the mindset from the community and also the technology impact. Because you are producing running software, uh, software that will work, you will see immediately the impact of that technology. And this gives really a sense of purpose around the, uh, the community. And because this is a, a widely used technology, even in space, you will see that people will be proud of working for this software project. Face to face. Face-to-face -face is an important aspect of the of software development and in this case for the community. And they realized this since early years that they need to go to face-to-face. To -face. And, and especially in a mixed environment where you have distributed teams, teams working inside companies, other teams working in different companies, that they must meet. And the, the gatherings that the Linux community started to organize are now so big that they already have specific conference to talk about specific topics, like the one that you see saw for automotive or security. And, and so these events are, are, are made around people meet, conference of course, learning about the, the new stuff that's happening, but also hands-on sessions. On every conference, there will be a session where people just meet in the room, open their computers and start coding and start discuss code in live and do these changes in, in, in a real, face-to-face -face environment. And of course, the last topic, decentralization. So as you saw, even the tools allow a decentralized model, and decentralization is key to scale this big. And decentralization is really not about command and control, so it will be impossible for someone to control this from a central point. And like the community learning that the, 
the 10 first years that were not able to scale, they need to, they had really to take to take decentralization. So they built these networks of trust, Linux trusts, Linux Torvalds trusts the network of the subsystem maintainers. The subsystem maintainers will trust the driver maintainers. The driver maintainers will trust the developers. And this is, was the way that the community uh, got to scale this big with this software. And so the last message for me is like, may the distributed be with you. And I think now we will open to questions, right, Joan? Thank you so much, Carlos, for this amazing lecture. And yeah, are you ready for some questions? Okay. Okay. Want me to stop sharing my screen? It's up to you. Okay. Ready for your first question? Yes. Okay. Uh, would it be the case that openness plays a significant role in the distributed situation? I wonder your thoughts about challenges for closed teams. So closed teams, uh, they, they, they have a different mindset. And um, closed teams probably won't, won't scale that big of innovation. So I, I believe in innovation and I believe that open systems are better for innovation. And the history proved that, that the, the software that was closed, they died. You saw Nokia with their operating system. They didn't saw this happening from Android. You have different cases where they tried to close the technology and at the long term, this is a, a dead end. So I really believe that openness and, and trust is really the key for technology to thrive. And this is the key for innovation. So I, I really believe in open, open systems, open communication, open networks, and open innovation. Of course, you might have some cases that you still need closed models for development. But for example, the Navy, it's using Linux. So they are still able to, do, to use Linux in probably some confidential uh, aspects of the Navy. But they are still able to cater open inside their, their development. Perfect. Second question. How can you teach people to work a sync? Any good example that you've heard of? Uh, well, I can talk about myself. Uh, I worked in a company where I had to lead a team of uh, developers. So I had to, to change the mindset from these developers to start contributing to Linux. And inside a company, sometimes it's hard. So I started to eat my own dog food. So I, I learned how to send a patch, even if it was a simple patch. And I learned how this worked. And sometimes in the beginning, you, you, you don't know. So you send a patch and you will wait. And this can cause some anxiety from your side because you might still wait one, one day, two days, nobody answers. So it's, it's, it's really a process that you need to go through to really understand how we do it. But after you get the first comment from your code and see someone is alive on the other side of the world, say, wow, this is great. And this is a, really a process that you need really to change the mindset. And of course, the decentralized model uh, is really key because you cannot trust on command and control, right? Usually in companies, you send someone and you're waiting for that person to answer immediately, or you talk to her boss or his boss just to force the answer. In this case, you needed to rely on others and you really need to rely on a community. But after you get the sense of this work and you, get, and you start getting some comments and feedback, this is great because you just, okay, I will lose control and then I will, I will embrace this way of working. So I think the best way will start doing experiments and eat your own dog food. Try experimenting a sink. Perfect. Can we use the Linux example to scale development teams as well as in companies? Do you have any examples of companies that did that? Yeah, so uh, I think Google is using some of the aspect of this distributed system. Even in Intel, they, they are using it because they are contributing to the, to the community. So we have uh, good examples of companies using, using this model. Of course, they cannot, in some cases where the code is their, uh, their, their, their property, they cannot release the code, but internally uh, you can adopt this type of, of mindset. Uh, there are a lot of companies using this, uh, this, uh, this type of working. And if you check the companies that I showed you that are working on a community, probably, they are doing this, this same type of, of, uh, of approach. Like, like I said, like my, ex my experiment in the past, I was working in a company and at the beginning, uh, the VPs would say, okay, let's try to do this the company way. And after a couple of months, they just, no, it's not possible. We, if we want to contribute to the community, we really need to play by their rules. 
And, th and this gives a challenge because you have someone working technically on something, but you still need to manage his career and all the aspects. So the companies are still needed in these mixed environments. Last question. How did the distributed team concept emerge in the Linux development? So I, I think it was born from need. So when Linus sent the first patch, the first message to the community was just saying, hey, it's just an hobby. I just want to hear opinions. And after they, they start to engage. So at the beginning was mainly university engineers that were contributing to the kernel. But when companies start to put money, the, the thing emerged. So I, I really believe on emergent practices. And this was really a community driven project. They discussed a lot about emergent and they, they decided that the best way was let go of control. And so this started to emerge. And you and in, in the Linux, it's, it's funny because you have probably some subsystems that might uh, work differently. They might uh, meet face to face in, in different locations or different time zones, but this is really emerging. So that the subsystems are deciding what to do. Linus Torvalds no longer cares about uh, what people are doing only if the code is not working. This is when you can see Linus Torvalds pissed off. But this is really about scaling, looking at working at the code and let uh, emergent organizations uh, flow. So if you see the code and the way subsystems are organized, it's really a mirror of the architecture of the code. And this is a, a, a flow of two points. So the organization emerged from the code, but also the code adapted to the emergence of the architecture. So it's really a, a loop of feedback. So it's really uh, let, let the practices emerge. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the amazing lecture. Thank One you. final, final question. <laughs> what was the worst trip you've ever made? The worst trip? You've ever made. Man. <laughs> Just say it. Uh, worst trip. Ah. It went uh, bad. Unplanned. Well, I, I, I don't remember because all, all the unplanned stuff we tried to, to adapt to change. <laughs> so even if it was bad, I don't remember because probably we tried to, to adapt to change and take it the best. <laughs> Perfect. That's a good question. That's but, a I, good but, question. I, but I can answer to the best, to the worst Sunday I had. That was the first question we will do it offline. So the, the worst Sunday, it's a hangover Sunday. <laughs> We're drooling around the house without be able to do anything. I think we've all had one of those. Yeah. So, thank you so much, Carlos, for the amazing lecture once again. Thank you, Joel. Special and thank you to the audience.